Uh, my name is Nikita. I'm from the United States, and I'm here in Amsterdam today to speak with Crime Think, a publishing collective based in the US, but with people contributing from all over the world. And we're going to be talking about capitalism and resistance in the 21st century. Crime Think is a collective that's been around for about 16, 17 years, and we We've done a number of different things. It's kind of a kind of a brand, kind of an umbrella that a lot of different people have taken action under. There are books, Rolling Thunder magazine, zines, posters, and other publishing projects, and a core of people who edit and produce, update the website, distribute the literature. But then there's also a much broader collective of people who have done a lot of different things, including writing and contributing to the publications, but also organizing tours, organizing conferences and gatherings, actions, campaigns. So uh, the, the thing that brings us together is uh, a passionate commitment to living our anarchist ideals in practice. And what, what makes us different from a lot of other anarchist groups that emerged as a part of the left or from a, a fixed political tradition is that we started not from a place of having a set ideology, but from a place of the alienation that we felt in our everyday lives and trying to figure out how to struggle against it. So our anarchism and our, our commitment to fighting all forms of hierarchy kind of emerged from this, from our daily lives. So in all of the things that we do, from the, the publications we produce to the actions that we take, we try to stay focused on our experience and what's real to us, and so yeah, we hope um, we hope that some of our ideas will be interesting. Crime Think exists mostly as a publishing collective, uh, but everyone who is involved participates in a lot of other actions, campaigns, social movements. One of the experiences that we're speaking about tonight is our participation in the Occupy movement in the U.S. Uh, some of which was more exciting, some of which was less exciting. And, uh, you know, in, in, in those cases, what, what is interesting for us about it is not the politics of the movement. Some of the Occupy politics were very reactionary. But that we think it shows a, a new tradition of struggle, a new way of people coming together. And so th this is an example of the, the kind of thing that we're trying to analyze and understand in the presentation that we're doing tonight. Mm -hmm. So some of our actions have been in the context of those bigger movements, um, and then uh, you know a number of different campaigns around challenging the political process, uh, challenging the presidential votes, um, uh, ch you know, uh, su supporting uh, resistance in the workplace, um, you know, putting out records from bands, a, a whole lot of different things based on the interests of people in the collective. The first full-length book that our, our collective produced was called Days of War, Nights of Love. And uh, yeah, and, and that was one of the things that characterized our, our original political analysis was, was thinking about, about love and about passion and what these things have to do with revolutionary struggle. And again, this has to do with our politics developing not out of going to college and reading lots of Karl Marx or being part of a big federation and trying to defend an anarchist place inside the left, but out of our own experience of what was most meaningful to us and how our desires brought us into conflict with the hierarchies that we found in the economy, in the organization of society, in gender roles, in, in all of these different systems that society has set up to keep these hierarchies in place. So. So love and, and passion is is one of the one of the most important things that that makes life meaningful and makes struggle meaningful. That that gives us the energy and, and and gives us the encouragement to keep fighting. And so we, you know, Crank Think is particularly the early books are sometimes criticized as promoting a politics of lifestyle or, or a politics that's. Uh, too individual and too based in, in feelings and the subjective. And I understand this criticism, but also, uh, you know, the, the North American anarchist movement over the last 10 or 15 years has catalyzed a huge number of people 
who were inspired by an analysis based out of our personal experience, based out of our desires and our passion, and have gone on to, to be involved in a wide variety of struggles. So one of the things we've learned from that is that this is actually a really important resonant place for politics to begin. And the, but one of the lessons we can also learn is that it's not the place where politics ends. You know? that, um, that these things have to grow together. Tonight in our presentation, we're going to be starting talking a little bit about over the last century, how people have come together to fight capitalism. We think that there are three different bases, three different places to start to find other people who are interested in resisting the system. The first we call production, meaning the, your role in the workplace, your job, your, your position in the economy. Uh, the next we call consumption, your, the things that you buy, the subculture that you're a part of, the music you listen to, your style, that sort of thing. And the third, which is the situation we find ourselves in today in the U.S. more and more, we call precarity, which is not uh, a shared job or a shared subculture, but a shared experience of being excluded or having no fixed place in the economy. So in the presentation, we speak about why we think that struggles that are based in production and in consumption have hit a limit, why we don't think that they can go much further. And while we certainly hope that people will still form unions, fight in their workplaces, form punk bands, and you know, fight in their subcultures, we don't think that these are the areas that are going to grow, that are going to be new horizons for resistance to capitalism. So we focus on talking about precarity and the, the way that the economic changes of the last century have created a new situation where we can't rely on the old compromises that previous generations made to preserve a place in the economy. So we talk a little bit about the kinds of labor that we do today uh, in, in the new precarious economy. And then we talk about some of, the, some of the ideas we have about resistance. So first, in terms of thinking about who is going to resist and how we're going to find each other, we think more and more it's going to be struggles outside of the workplace, outside of college campuses, outside of the traditional places that people have come together based in people across the continuum of society who feel vulnerable, feel like they don't have a fixed place in the economy. Uh, in terms of the actions that people will take, we talk about some of our experience with uh, different social movements, the ways that certain tactics hit a wall, and the ways that when people move from just holding signs or just trying to defend their position in the economy into actually interrupting the economy, that these are some of the struggles, particularly in Oakland and in Montreal, that we're able to go further and, um, and create an, new possibilities for resistance. In terms of an overall strategy for how these different struggles can link together, we don't think that the old leftist model of winning small uh, reforms bit by bit is going to work anymore, because in many cases, uh, the capitalists and the politicians who we would demand those reforms from aren't even capable of granting them. So we actually think that uh, that revolution might be more realistic than reform. So our goal is not just to win small victories, but to, to create a new way of fighting, to create a new precedent for struggle by experimenting with tactics that can spread uh, and, and become contagious. And so that leads into the last question, which is what's the role for anarchists in this? And we think that anarchists have an important role to play, not as a vanguard or as the, as the center of a struggle against capitalism, but as people who are willing to expand our sense of what's possible, to uh, challenge the boundaries that we set around tactics and in movements and around struggle, and also to create a new sense of what's legitimate, what we feel like we have a right to do. And to, to make these points, we talk about some stories from, from our town. We live in a small college town in the southeast of the United States where we had an Occupy encampment in an illegal building occupation. And in the U.S. where there's not a squatting movement, anything like exists here in Amsterdam or in other parts of Europe, we were able to occupy a building for 24 hours and in doing so, change the context of what people thought was possible and what people thought was legitimate in um, in our town. So we hope that from, from this analysis and from some of these stories that it'll start some conversations and we also want to learn about 
of the struggles happening here in the Netherlands and, um, and see what people are doing. When the Occupy movement kicked off in New York City with Occupy Wall Street, there were anarchists who were involved from the beginning, um, along with a wide variety of other people. But it was that original anarchist influence that was one of the reasons why things like consensus decision making and uh, you know, refusal to participate in any political party, why these were fundamental principles of the movement. So when Occupy, when Occupy became very popular and spread all over the country, there were over 400 encampments uh, at the high point. Uh, you know, for, for, for me, I, you know, in the town where I live, the anarchists in, in town got together and discussed, you know, how do we want to relate to this movement? You know, we, we don't agree with all of the politics or all of the reforms that some people are, want to win through it, but we recognize that it's a genuinely social movement, that there's energy, there's potential there. So we decided to, to hold the first assembly, to put up the flyers and, and call for it. And so in our town, anarchists participated from the beginning. And uh, in, in doing that, we were able to, to influence the direction, to, to challenge some of, the, some of the ideas, for example, that there has to be a nonviolent statement for every group that limits the tactics that are available to people participating in the movement. Um, and, and, and also rejecting the idea that we need to apply to police for a permit to have an encampment or to have a march, things like that. So this was different in different cities, depending on who was participating, depending on the influence of anarchists, depending on the influence of, of liberals who were more interested in collaboration with police or nonviolence. So the Dear Occupiers pamphlet came uh, a few weeks into the, to the Occupy movement as a, as a way of offering some of the lessons that we learned from our participation in other social movements uh, in, in hopes of, of influencing the conversation not just in the places where we were already participating but across the country. And kind of to our surprise, it, uh, it circulated very widely, it became very popular on the internet, it was, you know, unknown thousands of copies were printed and distributed in different occupations. And we think it actually did have an influence on, on the movement. And in particular in some of the places such as Oakland, um, where, where anarchist participation was particularly strong, and uh, folks working in coalition with others were able to set boundaries like no police in the encampment or uh, no not participating in the violence non-violence discourse that limits our, our ability to to resist uh, those were some of the places where the Occupy movement was actually more successful where it didn't just die after the initial eviction or after people ran out of steam when it got too cold things like that so at the same time, there was backlash. There was some strong backlash from from liberals and progressives who are very invested in the language of nonviolence. Uh, some people, like uh, like Chris Hedges, who is a, a liberal radical journalist, who wrote an article called "The Cancer of Occupy," in which he talks about the Black Bloc as you know. Uh, a force like a virus that's destroying the Occupy movement from within, and um, uh, yeah, and, and other writers who are who are prominent on the left in the U.S. who cited the Dear Occupiers uh, pamphlet as a, as an example of a you know a screed defending violence and things like this. And of course, the if if you've read the pamphlet, the the objective is not to promote violence. The objective is to figure out how we can work together with a diversity of tactics without, the, without limiting each other in how we can resist, making sure that we're supporting each other and not stabbing each other in the back by collaborating with police or creating divisions that make us all weaker. So, um, so we've continued writing back and forth. Some of the literature that we have here tonight addresses this. And in fact, uh, one of the members of the collective it had a public debate with Chris Hedges, this journalist, about the Black Bloc and tactics in the Occupy movement uh, just before we left to come on this tour uh, a few weeks ago. So there's a lot of people in the U.S. who are continuing to talk about it, even after the Occupy movement has mostly died down. 
um, through the Dear Occupiers pamphlet and through the conversations and, and essays that have come of it, I think anarchists have, have succeeded in changing the terms of the debate about violence and nonviolence, about tactics and how we work together in social movements. According to our analysis, the language of violence and nonviolence, this, this is not the most important question. This is, in fact, when we start talking about this question, we're getting distracted from more important questions like what is effective? What actually fights hierarchy? What actually stops oppression? And what kinds of tactics spread power horizontally as opposed to concentrating it vertically in, in hierarchical power? These are the things that we think are important. But by using the language of violence and nonviolence, really what that does is it creates a language of legitimacy where people who uh, refuse to conform to liberal notions of what's acceptable are deemed illegitimate and pushed out of the movement. And that makes all of us weaker. It, it divides the movement. And this is very important for the state. The state has always used this as a strategy to divide movements by trying to isolate more radical elements in it and appealing to the law and order sympathies of more liberal elements or reformist elements in order to split the movement and make it weaker. So what we're hoping to do in challenging this dichotomy of violence and nonviolence is to say this isn't the right question to be asking. When we frame the debate in these terms, the state has already won. If we can frame the debate differently in terms of, again, as I said, how, how do different tactics spread power and, and what is actually effective in interrupting oppression and, and changing our lives, these are the questions that we need to be asking. So again, this isn't a defense of violence. Certainly, as anarchists, we want to live in a society that's not based on force. And what is the state, if not the concentration of legitimate violence into one body? So, uh, so we, we, want to, we want to change the terms of the debate, and that's what the, the purpose of the pamphlet was. This is my first time. I've uh -huh. only been here for a couple of hours, but okay. um, I'm, I'm starting to learn some about the exciting history about squatting and radical movements and also some of the repression that's been getting more intense in recent times. And I want to say thank you to all of you for fighting and keep fighting. Don't give up. Let us know how we can be in solidarity with you in the U.S. and across the world. And, um, and thank you for listening.